Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Melatonas. And in episode number six, we're going to do a little update on what's going on with the new modern line preamps that are coming out. And uh, the main focus today is that we're going to actually go into the lab and we'll look at the actual schematics for what is be what we've named now the rocket. Um, and talk about the secrets to why it's such a great sounding preamp. So the, um, the circuit board and a bunch of parts for the next modern line preamp, which we'll talk about in a second, just arrived. Charles, you want to show off yeah. your creation? So here we go. So this is actually the second version of the board. And this often happens where we come up with the first version of it and then uh, make some improvements. So this is already sort of a version two, although it's the version one release board. The circuit's identical. It's, it's more the layout that had to change a little tiny bit. Mm -hmm. And some labeling features and quality of life stuff for the builders on here. And we feel like we've really stepped it up uh, and made it a, a lot easier for the builder to put these things together. Yeah. Now. A lot of people are kind of hung up on the idea of what's the best way to, to wire up um, a tube amp. Is it point-to-point -point wiring? Is it a circuit board? Um, is, is it a, a combination? Hi is it, yeah, is it a hybrid? And, um, and th the answer and the truth is any of the above will work well. It, if it impl implemented correctly. Ah, that's right. So we often incorporate more a hybrid design. So even on, I think on the circuit board, do we have wire jumpers, Charles? Yeah, we do actually yeah. have a couple of wire jumpers where it makes sense, and that's in some of the signal path areas to keep the, the signal nice and clean. Yeah, yeah. So the nice thing, I mean, years ago when I first got into this hobby, um, <laughs> years, decades <laughs> ago, uh, we only had one single-sided boards. Um, Maybe some very high-end applications had two-sided boards, but basically all electronics were single-sided. And um, now, when I say single-sided, I mean the components went all on one side and we would flip it over and we'd put the solder work on the other side. These are double-sided um, boards in which the components can go on either side and the pads can go on either side and what makes them so interesting is that uh, when you have a pad on the top, you have a pad on the bottom. And the hole through which uh, the component goes, whether it's a socket, a switch, or a resistor or a capacitor, it's actually got a pad right through the hole. It's plated all the way through, so there's a lot of contact surface there. It makes for a strong join, good electrical connection, and uh, and a great sounding preamp whenever you put it all together. Yeah, and from the very beginning, even on the smaller boards, we went with the thickest board the manufacturer could provide, the heaviest traces they could provide, and... Um, We've never regretted it. It's yeah. a bit more expensive, but it's definitely worth it. Yeah, and it'll make for a very long live board. And um, talking about uh, boards, here is the board for what will become the new modern line uh, 6 or 12 SL7 phono preamp. Now the circuit's going to be very similar to the existing classic line uh, phono preamp that has been the reviews for all of the kit amps have been very very positive but the reviews for the phono were just insane um, and um, and I think I think it's it's not so much about the design work uh, that we've put into it it's simply that we focused on one really important aspect of a phono preamp that I, as, as a vinyl lover and a collector, collector is the wrong word. I, I mean, I accumulate vinyl, but I listen to vinyl passionately. And so does Charles. We yeah. have an evening concert over dinner, and then most evenings I have a second concert. <laughs> but we focused on getting the preamp musical. And that has a lot to do with the 6SL, 12SL, 7 game stages. Um, and it also has a lot to do with sort of our design, design philosophy. It, it fits nicely into that. Anyways, the boards are in. Um, so 
Where is everything at? Well, Charles has actually already done a test boxing of the rockets. Of the rocket. Yeah. Everything fits in a much smaller box than the classic line. There's even enough room that there's a dedicated box to put accessories or a tube set. Um, and if not, then it just becomes filler, basically. But the box is lighter, it's more compact, so shipping will be more affordable. Uh, I mean, the, the whole sand, san, can I say that word right? Sandwich? Sand, sandwich. Sandwich, I cannot. It's yeah. like English is my third language or something. Um, <laughs> hopefully everyone's having a good laugh at my expense. Yeah. Uh, but the sandwich construction has really, um, it, it's done wonderful things mm -hmm. uh, for keeping the cost down, for build speed. Um, it, in fact, the whole concept will allow us to provide complete finished amps at a very affordable price point. So, so it's not just easy for you guys to build, it's also a lot easier for us to build for you. Yeah, because I would say for every inquiry we get for um, a kit amp, and I love getting correspondence about the kit amps, um, we, get, we get another correspondence that says, you know, can you make me one? And every, I think a lot of people who make those inquiries think, oh, well, maybe a hundred bucks and they'll build me one. Well, uh, it, you know, there's a huge amount of savings to building your own kit. And uh, even though it takes, it takes a fair amount of time and focus, um, I, I think it's one of the most fun things in the whole mm -hmm. hobby to build equipment that you're actually going to put in your main system mm -hmm. and run for years. Uh, but a lot of people just don't have the chops, the time or the interest. Um, or they've got tons of cash and they're happy to let us do a professional build. So with the classic line, we, we were happy to do custom builds for people or not custom builds, but uh, one-off builds with the new modern line preamps, we'll be doing small production runs. So we'll be able to populate the store with product. Um, and what's the, what's the timeline like? We're starting probably. I was going to say Monday, but we've got so probably many, end up being Tuesday. <laughs> we've got so many orders coming in. We actually found some GZ 34s, and they're going like hotcakes and 6550s, and they're going as well. Um, so it probably will start Tuesday. We actually have the the story. Start the build videos Tuesday. <laughs> start the build videos. Yeah, Tuesday. yeah, right. yeah. So that that's next. We're going to do um, ten or eleven um, episodes, and that will that will become, that YouTube build series will become the build manual, uh, just like the classic line. But because the amp is so simple, uh, it's gonna, the build series will be quicker, the episodes will be shorter. It's just gonna be a lot of fun to put these things together. Yeah. Um, so hopefully people don't build them too, so quickly <laughs> that they run out of things to build. But anyways, we'll deal with that problem when we get there. So that's, once that build series is done and we've proven that the new board works perfectly, we'll get the specifications on the lab bench. It's going to be time for test builders then. And then, yeah, yeah. and then test builders will get an email. Now we're pretty much full for test builders for uh, the rocket. Uh, but if you want to put your name on the list, we'll see sometimes, sometimes people drop out or we just don't hear back from them whenever we let them know it's time. And, uh, yeah, so you never know if you're, if you're next in line, you might get an email from us. Yeah. And, uh, we actually already have, we haven't asked, uh, called out for anybody to work, um, to do a test build on the modern line, uh, phono preamp. And we already have somebody jumped in there. He's number one on the list, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we pop over to the lab there, let's just take a quick look at this Modern Line Phono top plate because I think it's just a thing of beauty. I'm really happy with the labeling work on here, and I think this is going to look absolutely amazing in a lot of people's systems. Yeah, yeah and um, the the black finish, I think, is... is I like the black finish, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a matte black finish. So it doesn't show the dust as badly as a gloss black would, and it cleans up beautifully. A little tiny dab of isopropyl on a microfiber cloth, and it just wipes up. And it's surprisingly durable too. Yeah, well, it's fiberglass with a an epoxy coating, so it's it's mm -hmm. it's a pretty durable product. Um, and uh, the bottom plate, 
is not very exciting, but you can see it's got some ventilation holes and it's a universal design. So whenever we can do it, we make the plates universal so that one side or the other can flip. And the same, of course, this is the front plate for... Um, for the Phono. For the Phono. Yeah. So compared to the Rocket, which has a volume control, the Phono obviously doesn't need one. Yeah, and we did the same here. This is the uh, the back plate for the phono, and and this. Oh, well, that we, one's not reversible. <laughs> it, well, it is reversible. We we did it this way so that if we end up actually with a kit that doesn't need uh, this particular information, it can be flipped over. But um, it can only be built in one orientation, which is why we didn't label both sides. Mm -hmm. But we're always trying to think ahead because. You know, I would say we have thousands of different types of parts in our inventory and it gets expensive at some point to have different parts for similar jobs or tasks. So we yeah. try and add some flexibility. Try to add some flexibility. E even in our, our finished uh, products like this. Okay, so why don't we head over to the lab bench and we'll talk a little bit about what makes this preamp sound so great. Yep, let's go. Okay, now... A lot of, of um, reviewers and amp designers, uh, manufacturers will put superlatives um, on a piece of uh, kit that they're reviewing. They'll say, oh, it sounds fantastic. I just said uh, we were in the music room when we opened up the video and I said it's a very musical sounding preamp. And all those things are, they're helpful to know what the the, the, the cues of the sonics are, but um, nobody spends any time and actually explains why the thing sounds so good, because in many cases, nobody really knows. <laughs> but we, we spent a long time, it took six months to design the original, and I think we put, it only took about a month and a half, maybe two months to design this variant. So this is the preamp side. Let's start right at the beginning with the power supply and we'll take a little look at it and i don't know if we've actually shown this version of the schematic before on screen but if we if we haven't we've made some changes to it so that it matches up better to the physical build and is easier for the builders to actually follow yeah charles is a genius at doing that we we keep trying to up the game of the kit business um and it's just getting better and better and i think we're we're getting there now i think um and um the uh, one provisio is that uh, the schematics are always subject to change, mm -hmm. particularly before we publish them and put them into the information section as a free download. So if you start building based on this schematic, you do so at your own risk. Yeah, always grab the latest one that's available that'll be on the website or that'll be provided with the kit. Yeah, we don't publish the schematics until we actually finalize the kit and release it. Um, and we're really close. In fact, this is the, this is, these are the schematics that I'm going to build kit number one yeah. on. Unless we find an issue with that during the build video, this is probably going to be the final version. Yeah. So, of course, uh, we show a uh, low voltage region, mains power, and a high voltage region. All of our kits are universal um, uh, mains power, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can wire it up and you get exact basically the secondary is exactly the same you just need to put the right wiring into the mains now i'm not going to do too much of an explanation of things that everybody basically understands we have a, a, a bridge diode here bridge rectifier bridge rectifier uh, four diodes and uh, they take the ac secondary and bring it over to dc but the task of the power supply is to get the right voltage at the with the right current capability and then the hard part is filtering it so that we have very clean b plus or dc voltage to power up the actual amplifier that's where the magic comes in well it's mostly science but yeah um so we have a very common small first filter cap we have a choke that's very common in a circuit. We have an, another filter cap, 47 microfarad. We have a bleed resistor. That's just to make sure that when the amp's turned off, 
the cap the caps will drain down um, and make the amp safe um, particularly if the tubes are out an amp will drain a lot slower when the tubes aren't present yeah whenever they're in there and they're conducting they're heated up it'll drain very very quickly so the real innovation on this preamp design is that we put the really large filter cap 390 microfarad 450 volts we literally put it right before the 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 plates of the tubes well the plate resistors the plate resistors and the plate of the cathode follower yeah so that's not commonly done typically the the larger filter cap would be over here right after the choke that's how we would build that and that will work just perfectly fine but for a long time i've been wondering if we couldn't uh, do something uh, with the electrical supply that would give us a lot of current capability uh, right where we need it. And that's what we decided to try, and it worked brilliantly. So that, that is one of the secrets of this design, is just mostly just rearranging how the filter stage is designed. Mm -hmm. And even though this isn't a dual mono power supply, it actually simulates something of that by having a separate filter and capacitor stage for each one of the channels on the end here. And uh, we were just blown away by how good it sounds and the amount of stereo separation we were getting. Yep, yep. Because the modern line was designed to be more compact, more affordable, and dual, true dual model designs uh, like the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 preamp, which is our best-selling uh, kit preamp to date, um, it take up a lot of real estate. They use a lot of parts. In fact, we just pulled, what, five kits worth uh, to fill one order, and, um, and it, it took us... Like what? three times longer <laughs> for one of them than it compares to the rock. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's three times as many parts, and I'm not sure that there's that much of a, an improvement. Uh, there is a small advantage to doing it that way, but I'm not sure it's worth it. Um, so here's the, the actual... Um, preamp circuit itself and here we have the signal comes in on the RCA jacks um, we've got um, an ELPS pot right here and um, we've got a, um, a wire jumper that brings us right over to the grid stopper resistor on the uh, preamp stage mm-hmm it's a standard cathode biased stage, but here's one of the one of the little tricks and secrets of the design. There's actually a bypass capacitor on a bypass switch. So what that does is it allows you to run the circuit in either common configuration for a gain stage preamp. And uh, th so that means that we'll either bypass the cathode resistor uh, oh. or, or non-bypass, and that will affect the amount of gain that you get on the circuit, and it will affect the, how linear the things are. Yeah, sorry, I was looking at this and wondering what, what the schematic is showing. Here's the bypass <laughs> capacitor down here. This 15K resistor, what that does is permanently maintain a little tiny bit of a connection to this circuit, so that when you bring the switch in and out, no matter what the volume on the preamp is, you won't get a pop. Yeah, it, it will still happen if you just turned on the amp and you haven't given it a chance to charge up that capacitor. But the idea was that if you flip it, you know, after five or ten minutes of listening to see the comparison, you won't hear whenever the switch is flipped. Yeah, well, I think it takes, what, three seconds for the capacitor to fill or something? Uh, it's a bit longer than that, but yeah. it doesn't take long. Yeah. So we have one gain stage. Uh, if there's any single reason why the preamp sounds so good, it's the 6N1P Voskhod tubes. They are... They, they are a unique preamp tube. They have a very uh, open, fast, clean, clear sound. And by choosing to use them, and I've wanted to use them in a kit for a long, long time, um, we've Im imbued the whole design with that sonic. And our real our job as designers is to give a lot of clean power and juice to run the circuit. 
um, and stay, 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 get out of the road of the of the quality of the Sonics of that 6N1P. Yeah, the tubes are the amplifiers, and uh, we wanted to keep the circuit as simple as possible around it so we can really hear them. Now, remember I was talking about those big... Um, those big filter caps, the 390 microfarad, literally sitting right on top of the the plate supply. Well, they're right here. They're, they don't show up on this schematic because this is the preamp schematic. But that big cap is sitting right here. After the signal comes off of the gain stage, it passes through a coupling cap. That's pretty standard stuff. That just allows uh, the AC signal to pass and the high voltage DC that's present here is blocked. That's the whole purpose of a coupling capacitor. And one of the uh, other secrets of why this is such a good sounding preamp is the tube we've chosen for the cathode follower. And that's the amazing 6N6P. This is a Soviet era tube. It's a really a universal type. It can be a small power tube. It can be a, a voltage gain tube. Um, it can be a, a great cathode follower, an OTL tube. Um, I think it's even used in some power regulation circuits. Yeah, and we're running it fairly hot as a cathode follower. Not off, not over spec. Not over spec, but, but hotter than many. Hotter than many. And I one of the things we've discovered, when you run the cathode follower a little hotter, um, you you get a little improvement in the low frequencies from about, what, 140 hertz down? Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's a boom ba boom ba bass improvement. It's more of a refinement to the quality of the bass. More of a clarity to it. Yeah. And you can hear it right away. So that, that was, um, I think that was a really good choice. Uh, we couple here again, and then we're out. Mm -hmm. Now... You might have noticed that the one thing that we're missing is a coupling capacitor on the input stage. It's basically direct coupled. So there's uh, an ALPS pot, there's a grid stopping resistor, and that's it. The signal lands right on, onto the grid of the, of the gain stage. Now, 99% of you don't need a coupling capacitor on the input, and um, and we tried it we've tried the prototype builds both ways and without a coupling cap on the input stage is definitely an improvement it, it, sonically it sounds better it sounds it that way it sounds better and we'll when we actually do the build manual we'll talk a little bit more in detail about this but basically if you choose to use tested uh, reliable tubes as the amp is designed so there's a list of tubes that can be used in this in this amp, um, in this preamp, and you don't plug uh, equipment of sketchy, <laughs> dubious origins. <laughs> yeah. So if if you you'll be fine. You won't need a coupling capacitor. Most uh, DACs and um, uh, streaming devices, uh, phono preamps will all have. Um, a, an output coupling capacitor. Yeah. The same as we do right here. We have an output coupling cap here, so if there is ever DC present or something goes wrong with the following stage, it protects the rest of the circuit. Yeah, well, we, there's actually, you can see on the schematic, there's 98 volts DC present here. Mm -hmm. And without a coupling capacitor, that means that the signal would have an AC component that would be very low about, what is it? Uh, actually, this is a high gain preamp. Yeah. But let's say it's you're running typically one to two volts RMS AC as an output, though this preamp can go up to... <laughs> it can actually go up over 30. <laughs> <laughs> no, almost nobody needs 30 volts, even to drive a difficult monoblock. But that's what this the design is. It's a, it is a high gain preamp. Um, but if we didn't have the coupling cap here, we would also have 98 volts DC present on the output. And of course, not a lot of equipment is going to like to see 98 volts. In fact, not a lot of equipment wants to see 1 volt DC or even 100 millivolts. So yeah, so this is absolutely required. But over here, for 99% of you, it's not. It's a sonic improvement not to have it. It's more affordable to design the kit, not to even have the option. But in the build series, we're going to show you how you can actually put a, cap, a coupling cap into the build if you if you need one or want one. But 
I think the only people that would get into trouble is if you don't put pro good quality tubes into the gain stage. So you could have perhaps a ca catastrophic failure in the tube. So you would have a dead short of some sort and you'd have voltage coming back this way. That could destroy um, whatever is plugged into if, here. If it's not built correctly, if it doesn't have its own coupling yeah. cap or protection circuit. Or you like to cobble things together and just plug them into anything. Well, yeah, so this is not the preamp for someone like that. But if you take reasonable caution, you can, uh, you can enjoy the safety and the superior sound of uh, basically a direct couple input stage. So I think uh, that pretty much covers everything except for the design uh, philosophy of this preamp. It has, it's running in pure class A and it has no zero zilcho feedback. Now, I guess I was lucky as a young designer because when I got into designing tubes, I didn't have a lot of solid state experience and I didn't have a lot of experience using feedback. And almost right away, I much preferred the sound of tube circuits without any feedback whatsoever. But a lot of designers who've come across the tubes started off in solid state. Yeah. And, and in those circuits, there's feedback everywhere. Um, and there can be 100% feedback in a circuit. And you see it a lot now in, in tube circuits as well. And, uh, you know, every tube circuit that we've listened to with feedback, it just doesn't sound as good. No. So feed, feedback is a double-edged sword, particularly in solid state, but definitely in tubes. So in solid state circuits, it's absolutely required to make many circuits actually function. Without it, they just simply won't work. Um, but there are feedbacks also used substantially to reduce um, total harmonic distortion. And um, years and years ago, uh, amp manufacturers, when I was a young audiophile, were chasing the THD number, the total harmonic distortion number. And that was like the first spec they would advertise, and the lower was deemed to be the better. Uh, and move forward decades and audiophiles and designers have long since learned that too much use of feedback just destroys the sonics of an amplifier. And in my opinion, with, especially with tube circuits, no feedback is the best sound possible. Yes, the, the distortion is a little bit higher, but in most cases, the distortion is actually a favorable distortion. It would yeah. be second harmonic distortion. If you've got even harmonics, it can actually really help fill in the sound and actually provide that, that tube sound that a lot of people are looking for. And of course, the other thing that we've done with uh, this preamp, and we've done it, um, I think, really well, is we've kept the sh signal pass extremely short. Yeah, as short as possible. And the same for the, the modern line phono that we'll be talking about more later. Yeah, and that makes a huge difference. Is the signal doesn't have to keep the component count down, keep your signal pass short, um, and build a good power supply for it. And Bob's your uncle. The thing is going to sound absolutely amazing. I was going to say it's going to go like stink, but go karts go like stink. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our philosophy. I mean, we keep it simple. We try to keep the signal path as small as possible. We try to keep the number of components that are in there as small as possible, and uh, you know, sometimes keeping it simple is the best way to do things. Yeah. Now, you might think that, wow, that means you can make designs up in 10 minutes. <laughs> no. But the, the truth is that the fewer the components you design into a circuit, um, uh, the, the harder it is to actually get the design tweaked to exactly where you want it to be. Because a lot of design work, particularly in solid state, but in tube amps as well, people just keep slapping circuits on top of circuits until they get what they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, in my opinion, that's the wrong approach. So if you see a preamp that's filled with switches, lights, buttons, and tubes... Way too many tubes. Way too many tubes run. Because the chances are that really the designer thought, well, more is better, and then, well, more of more is better. And that's, in my opinion, that's absolutely the wrong approach. If you want a good clear, clean, fast sounding signal out of your preamp with low noise. Keep it simple. Okay, this is Jim and Charles signing off. Stay safe and have fun, everyone. We'll see you next episode.